Nguyen here. Today I want to talk to you about cooling systems for Corvairs on Zeniths. Today we have a pretty good opportunity for us. Uh, we have Ken Pavlou's 601 XLB here. This engine installation is actually a 3.3 liter Corvair. The airplane has 660 hours on it. As a 3.3 liter Corvair, it is absolutely the most powerful Corvair mounted in a Zenith aircraft. Yet the airplane has very, very good cooling. We'll show you some of the uh, stills from the instrumentation uh, in the uh, notes of this. But I wanted to give an overview visually of what the good cooling system looks like and assure people that uh, Corvair has excellent cooling with a couple of small rules followed. And I wanted to take a look at this particular installation. If this installation cools, any smaller engine will also cool. This has very good cooling and let's take a look at why. As we come through here and take a look at it, Corvair is, of course, a horizontally opposed, direct-drive, air-cooled six-cylinder engine. This aircraft, uh, in particular, has a standard Corvair installation as we do them at flycorvair.com. We've been doing these for about 15 years, and this represents the uh, typical refinement that we have. Uh, the inlets on the aircraft are, uh, here we can take a look at it, they're about five and a quarter inches in diameter. Uh, if uh, we've always told builders that they could use this much cooling or more, uh, it has inlet rings on the cowling. These make a difference. Uh, just merely cutting a hole in the front of the cowling does not do the same job of having an inlet ring. It substantially increases the flow of air. The baffling kit is from J.S. Waysman. Uh, these baffling kits are available specific for Zeniths. Uh, they have been available for many years, and this is what a uh, good, clean installation looks like using one of their baffling kits. The configuration always has the oil cooler back in this position here. This has a seven-plate oil cooler on it, and this aircraft has our typical 2400 lightweight starter on it, but let's take a look up front here. It has the alternator in the front of the engine. This is how we've done it for about 12 years. There's an option for rear alternators also. There's some mythology that says having the alternator front uh, in the front uh, impedes cooling. Uh, very, very specific studies will show that this is actually not an impediment to cooling, uh, even though it's right up here in the air inlet. Uh, good cooling starts with attention to detail, the same way that you wouldn't uh, fly a liquid-cooled engine with a hole in the radiator. You should never fly an air-cooled engine with a hole in the baffling. It's the uh, equivalent comparison. As we take a look, the baffling uh, is specifically laid out in a flexible manner, and it seals on the top of the cowling. The advantage of this type of baffling, as you see it on Cessnas, Pipers, all your traditional general aviation aircraft, this layout has always traditionally worked and allowed good access for maintenance on the engine. But this type of cooling allows both inlets to work, flow air into the motor, and it builds up on top of the engine with a high pressure differential to the bottom of the engine. This is what successful cooling looks like. Uh, separate plenums, as people get interested in, uh, plenum cannot share uh, air from side to side effectively. And if you take a look at the propeller on the aircraft and imagine it in flight, uh, it has an ascending blade and a descending blade and they pump greatly different amounts of air into their inlets. A system like this will share all the air that comes in the front of the cowling, build it up on top of the engine, and then let it flow through the engine. Again, we'll take a look at the uh, information at the bottom of the page and we'll show you some stills of what Ken's in-flight data looks like for cooling. But this is what successful cooling looks like, and it works well in an application with extremely high horsepower for a Corvair in a Zenith installation. This would work on all the models of 601s, would work on 650s, and would work on 750s stoles and cruisers. So utilizing the standard uh, layout as we suggested is the formula for success here. Let's take a look at the outlet side. Under the airplane, this is the bottom of the fuselage right here. Here's your nose gear strut. This is your uh, exhaust pipe. 
the uh, other bank exhaust pipe right there, there's the crankcase breather. This lip across the bottom is typical of general aviation cowls, and the gap provides the exit air for area for the air to leave the cowling. The lip on the bottom of the cowling uh, provides a pressure drop and additionally draws the air out. If we take a look at this, it's 21 inches across and the gap from the bottom of the fuselage to the bottom of the cowl is about three inches. This provides plenty of air and if you look at it, the lip is two inches long and bent down at a 45 degree angle. Again, Ken's aircraft is the highest horsepower rated installation of Corvairs and it cools itself very, very well. This would additionally work on 750 cruisers and stole airplanes and has for many, many installations. This is the standard air outlet that is long proven to work. Good cooling in an air-cooled motor assumes some basics. The basics are that the ignition would be timed correctly, whether it had a mag or a distributor ignition like a Corvair does, timing's important and you can cause overheating by having excessive timing. Also, we use very specific spark plugs in Corvairs. Uh, just because a spark plug screws in the head or some uh, automotive installation uses it, that's not the correct plug. We have the correct plugs listed in the description below. You also have to have the correct functioning carburetor. If a mixture is excessively lean or if you're using uh, fuel with inadequate octane, uh, you're not really going to be able to cool the motor. Uh, we've had successful installations running on automotive fuels for many years with the correct timing and the correct spark plug and the correct air fuel mixture. You can do a lot of different stuff with Corvairs, but the engine again, when we're looking at the basics of cooling, has to be uh, set up with the assumption that the rest of the mechanical systems are correct. It's not difficult to do. People do it all the time. We got a lot of people out there enjoying these aircraft engine installations in Zenith. Over the years, we've had about 150 people fly a Corvair in a Zenith. A lot of them had great success. A handful of people had difficulty. The difficulty can always be traced to one single factor or combination of factors where their engine differed from Ken's. Engines don't play favorites. They don't care who you are. If you made your engine installation look exactly like Ken's, it would work and cool itself exactly like Ken's does. There's no magic to this. There's only technical details that have to be followed. In a Corvair engine, there are two measurements of temperature that we're concerned with. We want to know the cylinder head temperature, and we also want to know the oil temperature. Uh, these are the two elements of an air-cooled motor, uh, particularly a uh, Corvair engine in an aircraft. So we're going to take a look at the cylinder head temperature uh, in this example, and also the oil temperature at a particular output of power. The cylinder head temperature in a Corvair is measured in two separate locations. One is underneath the spark plugs, and we refer to the seventh uh, spark plug is a location under the cylinder head used by the factory to measure cylinder head temperature. And oil temperature is measured in the gold oil filter housing, and it is measured before the cooler. So you're looking at the highest oil temperature in the motor. Now let's take a look at the flight conditions in this particular setting in Ken's airplane. This uh, represents a, a cruise at a 5,300 5, foot density altitude. Uh, the airplane is doing 127 miles an hour uh, true airspeed and the OAT is uh, about 58 degrees outside. If you look at this power output, uh, this is a very, very uh, high cruise power setting. Uh, 601 is a good solid airframe, uh, but it is not a uh, particularly slippery airplane. And to get this kind of uh, true airspeed, you're looking at a fuel flow of 8.1 gallons an hour. Uh, from my background, I can tell you that this engine to uh, generate that is uh, probably generating approximately uh, 110 horsepower 
uh, as a continuous output. The engine's output uh, at sea level is in the range of about 125 horse on this particular model. But this is a substantial power output where uh, it's a good test of the engine's cooling. This is not putt-putting along. This engine's working uh, pretty darn hard. Uh, take a look at the cruise RPM. That's, uh, it's turning uh, 3230 RPM. That's fairly high. And if you uh, uh, take a look at the cylinder head temperature, it's actually pretty darn low. Let's take a look at the, uh, the six uh, under plug settings. You uh, have uh, a whole range there that you can take a look at. Uh, number one is 288, number two is 232, number three is 331, number four is 260, number five is 309, and number six is 235. The orientation of the spark plugs in a Corvair is the two that are at the back furthest away from the inlets are one and two. Notice they're uh, pretty, pretty low, and if you want to see the two in the front, uh, that is five and six. Number five is the one right behind the alternator, and it's turning 309, as you would suspect. Uh, but also, uh, the numbers are pretty low across the board for an engine at this kind of power output. The uh, stock location, which is on the bottom of the cylinder head, is turning 274. And that's a good uh, saturation level. It's not measuring the temperature of the spark plug, and it's not very dependent on the uh, input of uh, cooler air outside having an effect on it. It measures the uh, the the uh, saturation temperature of the aluminum in the car. The cylinder head redline temperature at this location is actually 575 Fahrenheit. We don't use that in airplanes because airplanes, we want to talk about sustained temperature capability. In an airplane, we want to see that number uh, down below 420 at all times. So uh, having a margin between 274 and 420 is very, very wide and gives this engine excellent cooling. But again, the major lesson that I want people to take away from this particular example in Ken's airplane is... Here we have a very high output Corvair engine in a very common airframe uh, in the sense of the Zenith installations are the most common uh, locations for Corvairs to be installed. And when you see this type of high output engine operated at a high percentage of power in a well-instrumented airplane, and it's turning numbers this cool, it's a good example of what the system working correctly is. So again, if somebody has a Zenith installation that's not yet turning numbers like this, and they have an installation that makes less power than Ken's, there's a small issue to be corrected to get it straightened out and operating like this. Again, I, rec I look at Ken's engine under these circumstances as not magic, this is the standard that people should expect. And all they have to do is take a look at their installation and Ken's installation and see what is different about it and correct theirs to his and their engine, it's just physics, will have to turn the same type of numbers that his engine does.